Do you, do you have a section for one-liners in your brain, Jerry? Uh, no, but I do have jokes and a bunch of other things. That's interesting. I, you know, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, this is Friday, December 7th, 2018. We're getting near the end of 2018. It's Pearl Harbor Day, whatever that means. Uh, and this is an Inside Jury's Brain Call where Ken Homer is going to um, share with us some of his practices around the body, around somatic techniques, uh, when bringing humans together to discuss things that might be difficult, that might you know, require them to be present, that might store in the body. Um, and we will, we will dive in in different ways, but, but Ken, if you just wanted to, to open up the conversation and we'll see where it goes. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Jerry and I were just talking a couple minutes before the call started. I said, you know, since this is a call about the body, I'm recognizing that I'm having some anxiety in my body, which shows mm. up as sort of stomach flutters and a little bit of tension. And I actually associate that with a good thing because um, when I'm uh, going to be on in front of people, if I find I don't have that going on, then I get really worried. But a little bit of a little bit of tension is good. A lot is paralyzing. Unfortunately, I don't have that going on, so I'm not paralyzed. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to just switch my screen here so I can read some notes that I was taking for myself. Um, when I talk about somatic intelligence, it's one of many different kinds of intelligences that I like to work with. Um, I was trained as an integral coach, and we look at several different streams of intelligence. And my focus in groups is mostly on how do we bring out collective intelligence, which um, I'm sure the folks on this call probably know is not associated with individual intelligence have really smart people in a room together and they make very stupid decisions. So um, one of the things that I've been working with for a long time is, is somatic intelligence. And by that, I mean the body as a sentient intelligence. Um, I associate uh, somatic intelligence with uh, awareness of breath, with being able to ground ourselves, center ourselves, sense in and intuit what's going on in the field, proprioception, knowing where we are in space and time, and this new fancy word that's catching a lot of people's attention, presencing. How do we, how do we create a presence um, when we're working at people? And I'll invite you all right now, whether you can be seen or not. Oh, hi, Dave, good to see you. Um, I, I worked for a little while with a Huna teacher, which is Hawaiian shamanism, and he'd say, sparkle your eyes, you know? And I love that, because it's just like, if you, if you sparkle your eyes, it brings a different level of, of awareness to your, your being. So. Um, if you find yourself in a group and um, things are, are getting kind of low, just ask people, please sparkle your eyes and you can feel the entire energy of the room shift. Um, and get distracted by Jerry's notes here. So uh, a couple of questions I want to ask you is, um, I've noticed that in a lot of organizational settings, people tend to use their bodies mostly to carry their heads around. Hmm. And very often their heads are out in front of their bodies. They lose a vertical dimension. They, 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 they're out like this. And they, they tend to be um, so much in their heads that they're very easily pushed over if someone comes along and disagrees with them. They're not very grounded. So how often do you find yourself checking in with your body? I sit in my chair on my laptop a lot. And I have to set a timer and make myself get up and move and stretch. Um, it's uh, really important uh they say sitting is the new smoking so i move around i stretch i stare out the window i i look for the horizon allow my eyes to just focus on trees and unfocus from the screen these are things that i just need as a basic level of self-care and i often find in organizational settings that people self-care of the body is like the last thing on the list it's it's almost never mentioned so um I've got a few practices we'll go through today, but I just want to tell people right now that one of the best things you can do is put on some music and dance. Um, and if you're in a group of people, my experience at weddings and bar mitzvahs and, and settings is that if you play Motown, people will dance. Um, every age, every generation, you put on Motown, people get up and, and shake. And, you know, I think dancing is one of the oldest um, uh, forms of, of communication and recreation. You know, my Twitter bio says exploring how language, which includes gesture, speech, and symbol, can create a self-healing, self-nourishing world. Dancing with people is fun. It brings lots of oxygen to our body, and it creates a, a kind of a, a limbic resonance in the group. Have you all heard of the term limbic resonance? It comes from uh, a book called The General Theory of Love. 
if you saw the first Jurassic Park, um, the authors in the book make this case that, you know, the scientists were examining the baby Tyrannosaurus and the mother comes back and she's really pissed off. And they say, well, that's actually not the way things go in the reptile world because reptiles lack a limbic system and they actually eat their young. So the chances of the mother Tyrannosaurus being upset by that are pretty low. Uh, if it was a mammal that had a limbic system, then you'd find, um, you know, that, that there's definitely that uh, protective nature that, that kicks in. In limbic resonance, I think one of the best examples I can give is most people have had the experience of walking into a room and knowing instantly that the room is safe or knowing instantly that the room is unsafe. Like, oh my goodness, something's been going on here. I don't know what it is, but man, I need to be really careful. Or wow, what a warm, welcoming environment. This feels really good. Oh, that person looks like they'd be interesting to talk to you over there. In my, my assertion is that that is a kind of intelligence that is sort of the gestalt of all of our senses. Um, there's no real pause to analyze and you know use our cognitive intelligence here. It's instantaneous knowing. Anybody ever been driving up a really narrow, windy, wooded country road and suddenly you just get this feeling, I better slow down. And the next thing you know, there's somebody coming around the corner in the middle of the road. This happens to me a lot. Um, I think we all have this ability to extend our, our capacity for sensing far beyond our bodies. And I don't know too much of, of the science out there that's investigating this, but I've, my anecdotal experience and my own experience is that a lot of people have this, this happen to them. They're, they can sense when this is going to happen. So I guess you can look at Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields and dogs that know when their owners are coming home to get more, more background on that. Um, you know, I realize I've been on several of these calls with Jerry, and one of the things that always is somewhat troubling to me with regard to creating limbic resonance is that I see people who they may or may not speak, um, and there's never the chance, or there's really been the chance to just hear from folks of who's here. So in order to invite our bodies in, I'd like to open up the, the floor for just a couple minutes and ask people to say your name, where you're calling from, and how you're feeling in your body right now. And if there's something in particular at like the end of this call, and just take maybe one minute each, try not to be too much longer than that so it doesn't go on, but um, I just left the folks are here. So my name is Ken, I'm feeling much better in my body right now, and I want to get, um, I want to get feedback on, on how useful this stuff is, and I want to know who's here. I love being on Jerry's call, and it's really fun being inside his brain with all these webs of connection. Um, I can I can jump in uh, just uh, just because right. <clears throat> I'm Jerry Mikulski. I'm uh, really <clears throat> really feeling happy because I see a lot of people I love on this call and a few new faces. Uh, this is a topic that has a lot of juice and, and energy for me, uh, and I know that that those of you here care a lot about it. And I would like to sort of uh, contribute to the shared knowledge around these topics and, and collect up some things that I didn't know about and sort of curate them into my little uh, forest mulch fungus. I, I'm starting to think of myself as a farmer ant where I'm feeding the fungus and then we all can like feed off the fungus itself. So this may be a bad thing because you may start seeing me with like antennae and little, little fuzzy legs, but, but I'm gonna go with that. Who else would like to? I, al I already see you that way, Jerry. Uh, Gil, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful for where this is going to go, but still. So I'm Gil. I'm in Berkeley. I'm walking uh, in a beautiful morning. Um, I love to walk. I find that the more that I walk, the better everything is in my life. Uh, I'm a lapsed martial artist and uh, appreciate and kind of miss the physicality. And uh, I've been learning that my mind is not in my head, but in my body and trying to cultivate that in myself and in my interactions with other seemingly bodies out there that I deal with. And I'm going to go on mute because I'm outside where it's noisy. Okay. Thank you, Gail. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'm sitting in a car in some kind of warehouse district in Mount Vernon, Washington, while my husband talks to a guy about a shed. And um, I'm mostly in Seattle and, and I'm super interested in this because when I'm working with a group in a room, when things start literally moving and shifting and sometimes rapidly, sometimes slowly, um, people's behavior, people's thinking changes. 
And for me, it's all part of, you know, this kind of multi, we're multi-sensory beings. And so why don't we use those things? It's like the obvious, pass. I'm Dan Witzel. I'm uh, hanging out in Oakland, California. Um, it's a bright, sunny morning, and uh, the AT&T guy here is installing fiber, so I'm I'm distracted. Um, Ooh! But I'm going to get fiber out of the deal. So I'm how here. exciting! Exactly. I can go next. Um, sorry, I'm not, I don't have a camera. I'm, I'm Isabel. I'm in Portugal right now. I'm just on the coast, um, kind of south of Porto. I'm here to spend a long weekend with my parents. That's, that's why we just got to the hotel. So we were driving and I snuck away to go into a, a conference room. So that's what I'm doing right now. If you can imagine that, I'm just standing around looking awkward. I joined, uh, pretty much just heard about this yesterday. My CEO sent me a link to this um, conversation on the email. And, and I said I was very much interested. So he got me on it. Um, I've, I work a lot with groups, the working, learning and development, um, mostly in leadership development. And something that you said just earlier, um, Jerry, no, Ken, sorry, um, reminded me of something I heard. I was at the Mindful Leadership uh, Summit a couple of weeks ago in Washington, and one of the, the people who were facilitating mindful movement used an expression that was, we walk around like, like heads on a stick. You just muted yourself, Isabel. Oh, sorry. Um, we, I don't we walk know around like I've been talking. <laughs> we walk around like heads on a stick is the last thing we yeah, heard. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I thought that was a really good. It was a really good image, and it really like I keep thinking back on that. That was weeks ago, and I keep thinking back on it as something, um, you know, to kind of remind myself we we are not we don't use our bodies as sources of data, sources of information, or I mean, I don't. Uh, so. Yeah, very much interested in this. So thanks for having me. I'm going to go for, mute again. <laughs> thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. And the, our connection to Isabel is through Elliot Noss at Two Cows. <clears throat> so that's lovely. Um, thanks, Isabel. Uh, thanks for joining the call. We are just doing a quick check-in. Ken asked uh, each of us to say who we are and just, uh, how we're, just one word about how we're feeling. But we can go to a couple other people and come back to you uh, in a sec. Anybody else? My name is Gene Bellinger. I'm on a sandbar on the east coast of North Carolina. Um, usually in a little town called Kill Devil Hills, which also is a good discussion starter usually. Um, the topic is, is interesting because as I think about it, I seldom ever stop to ask myself how I feel about me. I'm usually engaged up to about here doing stuff and not thinking about how I feel. I, I would expect that if I stop to ask myself, I usually feel pressed for time. Um, but it's, it's pressed for time of my own making. So that's, I'm checked in. Awesome. Thanks, Gene. Uh, Les, go ahead. Uh, cheers, thanks. My first time here today and um, welcome. I've come through Michael Linton. Um, I'm in uh, Hackney in, in the London, early evening here. Um, I, I, I sometimes just, just go for walks. Um, as someone else said earlier, I just feel like I just can't do any more on a computer. And I really like what you just said, Ken. When, I, when I'm looking for my glasses or my keys, and I can't find them. And then I will just put my hands out and I know where everything is. But, but I, you know, I just sense where stuff is, but um, looking for it, I can spend half an hour looking for my glasses. Um, great to be here. I'm complete. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks very much, Les. Uh, Trudy, if you want to jump in. Uh, and you're muted. Judy, can you hear? Hello, hello. Well, Ken, back to you in the booth, and uh, we'll connect up with Judy. Okay, Judy, if you if you pick up on this, just wave, and we'll we'll bring you in. Um, 
Okay, so I thought uh, one of the first things to do is I, I, I'm all about tools. I do group facilitation work. And um, although I do a lot of reading, I'm not strictly a researcher. I like to take the information I get and try and figure out practical ways to apply it for folks. So one of the most important um, tools in my, in my toolkit is uh, a body scan. And I learned this a few years ago. I took a course from a woman by the name of Suzanne Zeman, who teaches something called listening to bodies, how to do coaching long distance. And um, it's really interesting because when you're, if any of you have ever done coaching and done it on the phone, you don't have access to the visual cues of people, but you can tune your body like a tuning fork to pick up what's going on in terms of tone and voice, the way they're breathing, speed of what they're talking about, and really get a lot of information about their state. And in order to do that, you have to first have a calm body. So um, we did five body scans every day and uh, did that for six weeks. And that really was uh, a great practice. And I recommend if you take this on, you won't get much out of it, just do it once. But if you take this on as a practice for four or six weeks and really do it three to five times per day, you'll have a much better sense of your body. And once you've done it for a few weeks, you can actually go really quickly through your body and, and pick up what's going on in a way that um, right now is going to take a little longer. So if you're comfortable, I'll ask you to close your eyes. If you're not comfortable with your eyes closed on camera, you can stop your video or whatever you like. Um, and just follow my voice. Now, you can do this seated, standing, or lying down. And what I recommend if you take it on as a practice is do the lying down at night when you're about to sleep because you may just fall asleep. Um, do the, uh, the standing in the morning when you first get up and do the seated sometime during the day when you're at desk just to check in and see how you're doing. So we'll all do this seated. So first, just feel your feet flat on the floor and take a breath. And connect with your breathing. Wherever you find it, you may want to yawn or make a, a sound as you exhale. I do qigong, and in my, my tradition, all of our breathing is inhaling and exhaling through the nose, so I tend to do that, but you do whatever makes you comfortable. And if at any time as we're going through the scan, you discover there's a part of your body that has some information that makes you want to move, feel free to move. This is not a hold still. This is definitely an exploration. So bring your awareness to the top of your head and feel your hair. Can you feel what it's like to have hair attached to your scalp? Or maybe you don't have hair. Maybe you, there's, there's air on your scalp. What are the sensations at the very top of your head? And just like, like honey dripping down your, your face, just feel your awareness slowly coming down your forehead and, and feel your forehead. Is it furrowed? Is it relaxed? Pay particular attention to the way you organize the fine muscles around your eyes. We often hold a lot of attention in our eyes. So just allow yourself to sense what's going on there. And now lowering your eyes down into your cheeks and your jaw. Is there tension here? Is it relaxed? And you may get colors or sounds or temperatures as you're doing this scan. That's all just information. We have so many senses available to us. And feel the back of your head and your neck. And slowly dropping your awareness down through your neck to your shoulders. What are your shoulders doing? Are they burdened? Are they loose? Are they open? Feeling yourself sensing now into your chest, and your upper back. What's going on here? What's it like to move from your head down to your chest and feel this, this body cavity with, with you know, lungs and, and different organs in it, your heart. The muscles of your back moving now towards below the rib cage feeling the viscera, your stomach, your liver. What's happening here? What information are you getting? Warmth, cold, colors, sensations, 
tightness. And going lower down to your pelvis, feeling yourself seated on the chair, or if you're standing and walking, you can still feel that. And now into the large muscles of the legs, the thighs, and the, those big bones, the femurs. The difference between muscle and bone versus viscera. And your knees. Down the front of your legs, your calves, and your shins. Down to your ankles. And finally down to your feet, tops and bottoms, maybe wiggle your toes a little. Feel your feet on the earth, your connection to the world, this whole world that everyone who's ever lived has walked and crawled upon, goes back to. And slowly bring your awareness back up from the earth back through the legs and on the way up, notice your hands. Maybe they're in your lap or in the arms of your chair. Are they open? Are they clenched? Are they loose, tight? The forearms, the wrists, the elbows, biceps and triceps. Back up to your shoulders, and your head. And now just take a gentle breath in. Smile at your body. Give it a little thanks for all the wonderful things it does for you. It carries you around to where you need to go. It brings you so much pleasure and joy. And just feel good that you're in a body. We don't all get that chance for as long as some of us have had. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back. So, you know, as a facilitator, I always have to say, how was that for you? <laughs> well, when I, once I've uploaded my mind to the cloud and my atoms are dead, I'm going to miss the body scan. Be like, all right, all the, the circuit's all performing. You know, how's it going? <clears throat> but uh, in the meantime, this is really nice. Thank you. I, I need to bake it in as a practice. It's, and, and you're right. This is a really excellent way to get yourself to sleep. It, it's very similar to my dad's advice when I was a kid <clears throat> of, you know, putting yourself to sleep by, by starting with your toes and working your way back up, you know, mm -hmm. through your body, which didn't always work for me. <coughs> Yeah, the progressive relaxation, is, it's very similar. I, I try not to, intentionally not to say relax this, relax that, but just become aware and notice. Uh, did anybody notice any particular holding or tension? Did you get information like, wow, that's interesting. My liver is blue or, you know, this black feeling in my stomach or this red feeling in my lungs, whatever. Anyone? I, I got no color. Sorry, it's Isabel. Um, I got no <laughs> colors, but I did. It, it's funny because I noticed that I, I, I was not stressed. I did not think I was stressed. And just doing that body scan, I, I was like, oh, actually, hang on. There's a lot of stress right now in my chest. I don't even know why, but it was just one of those kind of caught me by surprise. Um, and it's just such a nice practice. Thank you so much. I, I just love the body scan so much. And I neglect it because it feels like something that you want to dedicate some time to. So I never, I, it's not one of my go-tos, but it's, it is so lovely. Thank you so much. Oh, my yeah, pleasure. Thank Les you. was about to jump in. Go ahead, Les. You are muted. Les, well, Les. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Very aware of ten tension in my neck. Um, but what I noticed most of all that my, my breathing was quite, was quite shallow, but two or three occasions, I, I really took a deep breath. So something was happening. My body was telling me something, and I need to sort of spend more time with that. So I will do that. And thank you very much for the exercise. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. At the start of the exercise, I noticed that I was trying, I left my video on, and I noticed that I was trying to avoid RBF. Does everybody know what RBF is? 
<laughs> um, it's called resting bitch face. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a function of video, video conferencing. It's like, you don't want to, if, if your resting face looks like, or you kind of need to have a little more active expression or everybody on the video conference thinks that, that, you know, you're, you're disagreeing with what they've said. I mean, they, they, they impute a lot of meaning to, uh, to your idle behavior face. So, so I was realizing as you started uh, the scan that I, I was holding muscles up here to, to avoid RBF. And I was like, all right, all right, relax them, let go, let go. Mm -hmm. And actually having the video there during that part reinforced the letting go part rather than the <coughs> subconscious part. Thank you. It's really always interesting to hear from people what they become aware of. Um, as I said, most people tend to not be very aware of their body, you know, and although I do body scans regularly and I've been practicing a uh, pretty rigorous form of Qigong for 14 years, I constantly have to bring myself back to my body because I get up in my head, I get into my thoughts, I, you know, and I, I get out there ahead of myself. And um, coming back to the body sometimes can be startling. Like, I didn't realize I'm actually really hungry. I've been sitting here working for four or five hours and I haven't eaten anything. Or, man, I'm, I'm thirsty. I haven't, I haven't had enough water. Um, so it's a way of constantly or, or reminding ourselves to check in with ourselves. And when we do that, we find out where we are in the world. It's another form of proprioception. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, we just went through a body scan and, uh, I did ask people earlier if they just wanted to say who they were, where they were from, and, and how they're feeling in the moment. So if you'd like to tell us that, um, please do so. Um, I'm Michael Linton from West Coast, Canada, Vancouver Island. My principal activities are community currencies and um, Alexander Technique, which you may know of as a somatic mm -hmm. discipline. Um, my current present issue is, um, intense uh, thoracic outlet syndrome That's leading to an inability to type for more than two minutes at a time. Mm. So I get plenty of reminders of body these days. It's, it's yeah. quite an entertaining experience and rather humiliating for somebody with my pretensions. So, say um, <laughs> <laughs> la vie. We can Carry talk on. about we can talk about humiliation as a strong emotion a little later on. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little humiliation can be good though. It's it brings humility as you know, which is different from shame. I think. So, yeah, it's it's the constant deluge that's a little yeah. dragging. Yeah. <laughs> and However, Jude, thank you, Michael. Judy, you didn't have a chance earlier to check in. Did you want to say hello? No, I'm sorry. I this is really good to be doing today because somehow my other computer, which is sort of my backup, but I use it a lot doubled its uh, system memory spuriously in some fashion. So I was online for a couple hours with Apple support trying to find the errant file to get rid of them. So this is a lovely break and they agreed it was a good time to just let the system cool away for a while and see where we end up. And then, um, so for those of you that I haven't met before, I'm in Minnesota. I met Jerry about 20 years ago when he had a consulting gig in DC and Really happy that this uh, Yi Tan on steroids is going now. That's great, yeah. Thanks for being here. And thanks, Ken, for bringing back this topic that was so interesting in one of our earlier discussions. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, so um, I wanna shift the focus from uh, strictly to the body to emotions and feelings for a little bit, because um, they're, you know, we experience our emotions in our bodies. and. Um, in preparation for this call, I you know, went to Google, Dr. Google, and typed in difference between emotions and feelings and got some interesting information. Um, so I don't know that I agree fully with this, but I thought it was a, quite an interesting proposition. And Jerry's going to put a link up. Um, I sent him a link for this. But there's um, it, on this page, they talk about um, uh, feelings as being something experienced as a result of outside stimuli reacting with our senses um, or someone's, it might be our senses or someone else's sensibilities or attitude or perception. That's feeling. And emotion, they claim, is a state of consciousness where internal sensations are experienced, which can be produced by thoughts, memories, external stimuli, and may result in a physical state change. Feelings Ken, need to be, yes. Ken, what about moods? Uh, we'll talk about moods in a minute. Okay, great. Thank you. 
I won't leave those out. Um, uh, they claim that feelings need to be triggered by an external source, while emotions can be either internal or external. So I, I'm not sure okay I agree with either. That. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not entirely satisfied with it, but it does give us at least a couple of distinctions to work with. Um, and I'm not always clear that it's that important to distinguish between feelings and emotions. Um, if I can out Jerry for a minute, uh, a couple of calls ago, um, he admitted that when in another lifetime, when he was not quite the evolved person that he is now, um, I think it was a girlfriend at the time asked him what he was feeling. And he looked inside and went, uh, gray fog, you know, like, uh, no, uh, a lot of men, you know, in our culture, we're not acculturated to express much in the way of feelings. You know, we have pissed off and we have happy and we have, um, maybe fearful and, um, I don't know that we Angry. have a lot else. Yeah, Angry. that's the pissed off. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, but, you know, that, that's actually, a, you know, pissed off and angry is, is a distinction that doubles their vocabulary, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did say, send Jerry a, a link to a, a page that lists feeling words. Um, so for men who are feeling um, that their vocabulary for expression of emotions is stifled, I recommend you take a look at this, this list. This exploration into feelings and emotions led me to, you know, how many emotions are there? Now, Paul Ekman, who's the famous guy who does the micro expressions, you know, said that there are six emotions. And then there's some new research that came out of the University of Glasgow that says actually there's only four, that anger and disgust and, and um, fear and surprise are the same emotion in the beginning in the micro expressions. And then depending upon culture and, and social context, they turn into either, um, uh, sorry, I forgot what my notes here. Um, one second. Anger and surprise, uh, anger and disgust. So in some contexts, anger turns into disgust and in some contexts, surprise turns into fear. So again, I'm not entirely sure I, I agree with that, but these are folks who've applied, you know, lots of, of fancy techniques that arrive at this, but it still leaves us with this sense of we've got some basic emotions that show up. And for those of you who are familiar with the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence around um, what cultivates or, or sets the conditions for collective intelligence in a group, social perceptiveness is the very first thing. And if we're not aware of our impact on other people, if we can't read their emotions and recognize when we say something that upsets them or they find offensive or even disgusting, um, we can sort of tank the whole group. And likewise, when we are aware that we're... Um, we're saying things that people are, are resonating with that can help to bring stuff out. Okay, was that Gil that asked about moods? Was that you, Gil? Yeah. So um, when I was looking a, a while ago, I discovered there's not a lot written in the psychological liter literature about moods distinguished from feelings, but there is in the coaching literature and in philosophy, Fernando Flores and, um, uh, God, what's his name, with the passions, um, Robert Solomon talk about this. So in my coaching training 20 years ago, I was taught that um, where is this? I was taught that moods are um, emotions are weather as mood is to climate. So you can have uh, a climate. It's, let's, let's say your mood is one of pretty sunny, ambitious, you know, like you're filled with wonder and ambition and curiosity. And you can have a really bad day and have something comes up that really upsets you. But mostly you're, you're going along and you're in a good mood. You're in, a, you're in an open, receptive frame of mind. You're uh, happy to be in the world. Things, you know, the world looks good to you. And then you can have something happen that, that brings about, you know, some fear or anger. Conversely, you might be in a mood where the world looks very grim. You know, uh, right now there's a lot of folks in the, who are looking at climate change and saying, well, we have 12 years left, you know, do something here. And great urgency and, and the mood of that is very grim. And there may be moments where you go, oh, but this is going on and that's going on and, and it lifts you up. But pretty much the overall sense is, wow, this is very tough. And in, from a coaching perspective, we say that moods are a predisposition to action. So if we're in a mood of anger or a mood of resentment, um, that closes off certain ways of thinking and acting and behaving with people. 
And likewise, if we're in a mood of acceptance and openness and wonder and ambition, that opens up different possibilities. And there's different ways of working with that with, um, in groups. If anyone's familiar with John Gottman and his um, research on couples, he made a name for himself, I think, in the early 80s when he could look at a, uh, a newly married couple and in half an hour evaluate and say, this couple's going to be together for a long time, this couple's not. It has to do with their, um, what he calls bids for connection, when uh, one would turn to the other and, and say something in hopes of being met and, and amplified, uh, met in a good way, if their ratio was four or five to one of positive to negative, that was indicative of a, a marriage that was going to last. Likewise, Barbara Fredrickson has done some research. Uh, I think she's out of, she works with Martin Seligman, um, looking at companies that are successful. And they go in and, um, uh, you know, okay, I, I knew Jerry had all this in his brain. So she's gone into organizations where people are thriving and uh, where they're suffering and, and really failing and recorded their meetings and then analyzed the positive to negative ratio. And it got a little controversial she brought this mathematician in by the name of Osada, and he said you have to have a 3.14 time three, you know, ratio to one, which got some mathematicians really interested, and they said, no, that's bullshit. But I think the the premise of if you've got a high ratio of four or five to one of positive to negative, you're going to have a company where people feel valued, where they feel this is a great place to work, and they'll bring forth their best. At the high end of the scale, if you go above nine or ten to one, People start to feel like they're in um, in fairyland. In, in you know, like they don't they lose their trust. Like they 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 need some level of negative feedback of things coming back saying, "No, this is this is not right." So there is a range, and I go with Gottman. You know, if you want to have a, a high functioning team, a high functioning organization, you want to be aiming for the four or five to one positive to negative um, ratios, and that will help to create a mood in the organization where people feel, okay, I'm valued. Um, when I speak up, my ideas are listened to. They may not be acted on, but at least I'm taken seriously. And um, this is a, a huge context for organizational change, as I'm sure um, anyone who's done work in that, in that context will agree. Anyone want to jump in here or something? Well, I know in in corporate life, the, the teachings were three to five to one in terms of relational content being positive if you wanted to be able to have constructive input for relationship change mm -hmm. or organizational structure or function change. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me, and my husband was a psychiatrist and I think it's validated there as well, there has to be a relationship for the intake to be taken. And yes if there isn't a relationship that's built out of something that causes you to want to sit there and take it, um, intellectually, if not physically, you turn away. So I would concur. There's a, <clears throat> a whole bunch of things that, that these topics bring, for, bring up for me. So I'm being a little quiet while taking over the screen and showing stuff in the background because I'd love to hear where this takes everybody else. And, and, and we're kind of heading in a direction that I want to go in for future uh, Inside Jerry's Brains calls as well. So um, one thing for anybody on the call to think about is a formulation for a future call. Like, like is there a question we can take and, and uh, craft another call? Who else could be uh, in the conversation, et cetera? So let me, let me go quiet again. I can amplify um, this a little bit. Let me I just have to open a document. Um, um, let's go ahead. I have a need to identify who's in the cafe and ask them to mute. Somebody's dishes sounding in the background. And um, I muted Isabel's uh, mic from this side, thinking it might, that Isabel might have been standing in a cafe, but that didn't help the, the dish noise. So someone, we're still hearing dishes from the background of somebody's audio. And now nice. Ken, was it, was it yours? It might have been mine. I went to open a document and also everything went wonky, so I, I stopped and came back. Uh, it's been a consistent noise through the whole call. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I, but I didn't hear Wes's his need. I heard him say I have a need and then, then things. Oh, like sorry. Uh, his need was for wherever the dishes are being rattled in the background oh, okay. to, be mute, to be muted because there's been kind of this somebody putting away dishes sound through, through the whole call and I can't figure out where it's coming from either. Oh, that is me. My wife is in the dining room eating. That's so what you're hearing. She's, she's ah, okay. Like, oh, no. so, sorry. Um, she's, she's yelling, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, hey, we're all getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just drooling a little bit here. Yeah, it's uh, leftover latkes from last night. They're really good. Um, mm. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. <laughs> okay, so I don't have this woman's name off the top of my head, and it appears when I try to open that Word doc that it screws up my internet. So there's a woman at the University of California, San Diego, who's done some research on um, uh, the way people respond when you give them good news. Everybody's pretty familiar with if you, you know, if somebody gives you bad news, you, you want to have some empathy. But it turns out that Empathy is really important in relationships for good news as well. So she has a uh, uh, four um, quadrant. Is any of these people? Let's see. Um, Naomi Oreskes? No. 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 Uh, she might be actually try UCS Santa Barbara rather than San Diego. Do you have that? I do indeed. Laura Kalman, uh, Annabelle Ford, Deborah Lieberman, Aida Hurtado. It might be, no, I don't think it's Deborah Lieberman. No, I, I, will, I will get it to you in time for you to put the notes up after this call. Yep. I do, I do have it, I just can't access it in the moment. Cool. Um, so she talks about active and passive, constructive and destructive. So the way this works, you put a little you know, thing together of, of above the line is active, above the line is, is passive, and then the, to the left is, is um, uh, constructive, to the right is destructive. If someone says to you, if let's say your wife says to you, you know, wow, I'm really stressed at work, you know, and things have been tough, and then she comes home and says, I got a promotion. An active constructive response would be, wow, that is fantastic. You so deserve this. What do you want to do to celebrate? Let's go out. I'm so proud of you, right? And a passive constructive is, oh, that's nice, you know. Um, and an active destructive is, well, I don't know, honey, you know, you've been saying how stressed you are at work. Is this really a good thing? Are you going to be able to handle this? And then the, the worst one in her, in her model is actually the passive destructive, which is, well, let me tell you about my day, where you don't even acknowledge that. And I've taken her, her little uh, quadrant thing and added for myself um, what the body language and the, um, the tone of voice is and where your eyes go. So, you know, when you go, oh, that's great. You know, you have this big smile when you're reaching out, you're being touching them. Or um, when you're, when you're, it's, it's, it's active, um, passive constructive. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's, that's nice, you know. And um, so this bringing in of the body and really recognizing. Um, I'm is to... it one of, um, sorry, Ken. Uh, no, that's all right. This is, this a, point, this yes, is a fully I, referenced article, but I'm, I imagine it's one of these people down here. I think that is her. Collins or Feeney? I'm seeing Kate Conlon, um, Katie Conlon. But that's, yeah, that's, this is definitely what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, no, no, Katie Conlon, sorry. Katie Conlon is the author of this poorly referenced blog post. Okay. These are the oh, references okay. you're citing. So is the name of the person, the researcher you're looking for among these references? No. Should be. Well, that's, Collins. that's weird. Maybe Collins. Hmm. Because uh, she's going through all the passive destructive response, the passive constructive, et cetera. So it's all, it's all there. Sorry for the digression. I'm just trying to find the reference. We will get it later after the call. No worries. Thank you. Now, every, time, every time I activate Spotlight on my Mac, it, it backs out my, my audio. So I will get it to you after this call. No worries. Um, so as I say, you know, my job as a facilitator is to take abstract stuff and, and try to put it into something that's really practical. So I will put tape on the floor and label these quadrants and then I'll have people come up with different scenarios and role play and they, everybody gets a chance to move through each one of the quadrants so we all get the sense of what it's like to really experience giving the active or passive feedback and the constructive and destructive. And in, when I've done that, people have really spoken up and said, this is really incredible. I, I recognize that I often am in uh, passive constructive. I try to be constructive, but I'm more passive than I thought. And this brings me to the concept of a mindfulness spell. 
um, as it applies to the body. So Thich Nhat Hanh is a fairly well-known Buddhist teacher. And in the, uh, he runs a, a retreat center in Plum Village, which is in the south of France. Um, and in the late 70s, early 80s, they were getting so many requests from people to come that they needed a phone system because they were all, you know, they were, didn't have a phone system at the time. And he was very resistant. That's Shelley Gable. Shelley Gable, that's the name. Yeah. Okay. Um, so his staff was saying, you know, we really need a phone system. He was resistant. And finally, he said, okay, I tell you what, we'll put the phone system in on the following condition. Whenever the phone rings, anyone anywhere who hears it will stop and smile and then proceed what they're going to do. So they'll stop and smile, pick up the phone, they'll stop and smile, go back to washing dishes, whatever. So I love this concept of the mindfulness bell because I've applied it to myself in terms of language and body posture. So there are certain phrases that I find myself using sometimes where I'm like, uh-oh, that's a mindfulness bell for me. When I'm talking about climate change or ecological problems, I say, we must, we have to. And I recognize there's that. I, I make the fist and I, I get really into this. My whole body gets engaged and I go, oh, that's an energy of kind of being preachy <laughs> that really turns people off. And so when I become aware of that, I'm like, let me back off. There's plenty, you know, this is my perspective. There's lots of ways to handle this. And um, it becomes a way to just sort of tone myself down and, and step out of that urgency energy, which kind of can take over really in a, in a hurry. And it might be time to actually move into to doing an exercise around what happens when we get caught up in something like that. So I'll just pause for a minute if there's any questions and we move on. I think, I, I think part of what you were just talking about is really relevant to the current sort of digital detox movement. <clears throat> you know, we're, we're, we're too much screen time, we're too attached to our devices, we look at our devices 3,000 times a day, kids are being overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. So one way is positive associations, right? If, if, if the device can actually be a trigger towards some kind of mindful thought uh, or a smile, as you just said, that's really interesting. That there's a whole bunch of, that, that's a, a whole interesting path on its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. It, there's a piece of um, when you, the sort of positive affirmation, there was an anecdote that a facilitator told about a parent interacting with a rambunctious teen, you know, and the teen came in all wound up and pretty much every opportunity or pause in the dialogue, the parent just sort of said, hmm, and they kept going. And at the end, the teen said, this is a really great talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just a gentle form of acknowledgement and I find I have to restrain myself because my curiosity causes me to want to ask a question that would draw something out but that's probably counterproductive to the flow of the other person and so I've been more effective since noticing that yeah yeah well if you if you look at Otto Scharmer's theory you he has something very interesting in there where he talks about um, uh, levels of, I, I refer to them as levels of listening. I'm not sure he does, but um, I think he does. We, we listen, the first one he calls downloading, which is basically listening for agreement. Okay, good, you agree with me. I don't have to think, we can just move right along. And I associate it with shallow breathing because you know nothing, there's no ego involved. It's, it's not a problem if, we, if we're getting along. Then the next level is, um, uh, I call it disconfirming. Someone says, no, I disagree. I see things differently. If we're not more anchored in our bodies, we can get really wound up around that. And um, so it requires a deeper level of breath. The next level down from that is empathic listening, where you're not listening for um, content. You're listening for what's it like to be this person? You know, what are they afraid of? What are they drawn towards? What are they passionate about? What motivates them? Um, how does it feel to be in their presence? How am I literally impressed? Where do I feel them touching my, my body and like, oh, I really like that. I, I'm drawn to that. Or, oh, I'm very repulsed by that. It's, it's a much more visceral level of listening. And the last one, um, presencing, I, I refer to as enlivening, yeah. right? Which is ah. what is bringing this conversation alive? I, I spent 10 years working with Anita Brown and David Isaacs at the World Cafe. We talked about you know, the future being born in the present moment through conversation. So what in the conversation is attempting to be born and brought to life 
And the easiest way I can describe that is sometimes you're talking to somebody and, and a topic comes up and you get, you know, goosebumps like, wow, that that's really alive. Or you go, Oh no. And that's also real life because it directs our attention. It captures, it moves our bodies in a way where we go, yes, I want to move toward or away from this. That's something that's, that's living, that's, that's coming forward. So how can we attend to that in a way that, that will bring it forward positively for us? Yes. I have a question because it's leading me along a path of um, mindfulness and being in the moment, which by definition is usually non-judging. It's just this is. It's not saying it's good or bad. And some of what you're suggesting is at the boundary of, but I'm judging. So maybe a topic for future discussion, because we could easily spend a lot of time on it, is, I don't know, some boundary between observing and judging or observing and critical thinking. Or I'm not quite sure what the right phrase is, but the sort of mindfulness without a vector of effect mm -hmm. versus attention with a vector in mind. I'm not saying this very well, but I- No, I think that was very well put. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be a great future call. Um, so let me, let me shift the energy here a little bit. I'm gonna stand up for this. And for those of you who are comfortable standing, I'll invite you to do so. Um, Let's look at what happens in our bodies when, when strong emotions arise. So um, the first thing I want to say is take care of yourself. Um, if I ask you to do something that you get an intuitive fit, that's not right for you, don't do it. You are in control here. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that, that is inherently dangerous, but I don't know what your background is. You may have, um, you may have something, some unresolved trauma. I don't want to trigger anybody. So please take care of yourself. You're in control. Um, we'll start with um, presencing something really good. So again, I'll ask you if you're, if you're comfortable to close your eyes and, and focus and, and bring to mind somebody who you really love, somebody who makes you smile, someone who when you think of them, your heart just opens. Might be a beloved elder, mentor, might be your, your spouse, your lover, your partner, might be a child, uh, dear friend, and just, let them dwell in your mind's eye for a minute and, and feel what it's like to recall them and to presence them for yourself. And kind of do that body scan of just sweep your awareness through your body. Where do you sense what's happening in your body as you smile at this person and remember the good times with them and the love you feel? What happens to your breathing? What happens to your posture? And again, feel free to move as, as needed. And now if you can think of one of the best moments you can, you've ever had with this person and what it was like. Maybe you were laughing hysterically and couldn't stop. Maybe it was just a real tender moment. What lights up in your nervous system when you bring this memory to mind? What happens to your eyes, to your mouth? What happens in your chest and your belly? And now breathe in all that goodness from them and breathe out gratitude. And send them your love and give them the big smile and thank them for being here and let them go and come back. So did anybody notice any shifts in their physiology as they went through that process? Yeah, a sort of a softening of everything, and then at different points where I connected with the uh, the old emotions, just a, f a flushing of, of energy through, um, maybe a flash of, of light or energy or something like that. But uh, yeah, many many different <clears throat> many different kinds of reaction just from a very simple exercise. So 
Anybody else? I, I was standing and I noticed that my shoulders were much further back and my chest was out and my heart was beating. So it, I, I did react in, in a physical sense. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, I see your, your chat. Did you want to say anything more about that? Maybe you can't talk at the moment. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mobile would interface. <coughs> it certainly seems to work for me. Um, just the association of the idea of presenting either a history or a future. And it grounds, I find myself more in the bones, more in the breathing. Mm. It's um, just a, a brief interruption, sorry. It's kind of amazing how little time we make in Western modern society to pay attention to any of these cues, to dwell with any of these feelings, to sort of do any of this, this kind of work. And it ain't, it, it ain't hard. It's, it's just not in our habits. It's not in our training. It's not in our consciousness so much. So thank you for this. You're welcome. This comes back to something that... We were on the call a few weeks ago and you were talking about affective priming of how just, you know, um, asking people to read uh, a story and one group was told that, you know, one thing about the story, the other group was told something else and you get totally different interpretations. Um, <coughs> very important for um, doing effective work in groups to bring people into a place where they feel that they have access to resources, you know, and one of the best ways I know to get access to, to resources is to pause and remember someone you really love because it just leaves you feeling good. And you're like, okay, I have strength to move through this now. Right. So we're going to do the same process a little bit, the same basic process with a couple of um, nuances to it now around something that's challenging. And before we do that, I want to show you um, a cleansing breath. Um, this is a modification of something I do in Qigong. Um, I'm going to do it very gently, so it's, it's quite easy to do. Uh, but it's a rather forceful breath, and it's going to look like this. I'm going to take my mic out for a second. Can you all still hear me? Okay. So I'll back up a little bit here. Try not to trip over the footstool. So I'm going to raise my arms up like this. When they get to the top, I'm going to make fists, and I'm going to force them down with a breath. So it looks like this. This is a great way to move energy quickly out of the body. When we get caught up in something that, that really catches our attention and takes us out of ourselves and puts us into a, a, a triggered state, um, according to Jill Bolte-Taylor, if we're in a full-blown amygdala hijack, our executive function goes offline for somewhere between 90 seconds and two minutes, during which time we have no access to uh, all the things that make us rational and, and, and um, uh, good people to be around. And ways to discharge energy. Gene, did you have a question? <laughs> No, you did. It just seemed as though you went mute for a moment. Uh, yeah, Ken, your voice uh, cut out for 10 seconds there. Oh, okay. Um, so I was, I was saying that it's very, let me put the headset back in. How's that? Is this better? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's really important when we start to look at how to work with strong emotions that we have a way to get discharge them from our body. Because once the chemical cocktail of hormones starts going, once the adrenaline and the cortisol starts flowing, we can lose access to our executive function. We no longer can plan. We no longer can, can consider more than one perspective. We just zero in on, on our feelings and we get literally taken over. Um, so it's, it's uh, the best way I know to, to, um, change that is to breathe. Jill bolte Taylor in her book, My Stroke of Insight says an, an amygdala hijack takes us, our executive function offline for 90 seconds to two minutes. And she says, there's nothing we can do. I think <coughs> that 
somatic interventions that can that can short circuit that and make get the flow out a lot faster. Um, one of those is a cleansing breath. So I offer that as, as a, a starting point here. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is um, bring to mind something that really makes you angry, something that just gets your blood boiling. You know, maybe it's the current political situation. Maybe it's, you know, um, maybe you have someone in your life that you've had a really difficult interaction with and you feel really unresolved about it. Um, maybe it's the injustice in the world, you know, something that, that is significant for you that when you encounter it, makes it really difficult to be present. And maybe we can put some stuff in the chat window so we, we can all have benefit of, of collective intelligence here. If you're having trouble thinking of something, maybe someone else's will, will stir you. No, Jerry's, Jerry's, you're, you're good. You got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> So I get really angry about what's happening with all the plastic in the world. Every time I come home from the store and I have to peel off this plastic package, I'm like, this is so stupid. Yes, it's so stupid, but you bought it. I did. And, and just as I'm, in, I'm embedded in systems that I want to change that, that are extremely difficult for me to change. And if I choose to go without creates a big hardship for me, I'm kind of stuck buying it at the moment. Which also makes me angry. I had an adding machine where uh, old school, one of the bands says buy a new one. I'm like, but everything is fine on this except for this one thing. He said, it will take me an hour to take this machine apart. The part's going to cost $2. They'll put me an hour to put it back together, it's going to cost you $75 in labor. You can buy a calculator for 30 bucks, buy a new one. I'm like, that just spread me. So, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm silly, but these are the kinds of things that they, they, they get me. You, I just put a, I just put a link in it. Sorry, Gene, go ahead. Do you miss your rotary phone? I don't. Um, I just put a link in the chat to something called Hyper Objects, which is uh, basically uh, an idea from Timothy Morton that these are pro problems that are too big to understand. So climate change, globalization, uh, you know, plastics in the world as a, as a, as a large scale phenomenon. And I think they're, they're overwhelming and they, they create both a sense of helplessness like, will my little pathetic actions as one individual make a difference? And also a sense of overwhelm <clears throat> in the sense of, oh, my God, we're never going to fix this. You know, the, the endocrine disruptors in the water supply, uh, what have you. And these are all pervasive large-scale problems, some of which over time we've, we've actually dealt with culturally, right? I mean, putting, uh, putting seatbelts in cars and then later lots of other safety devices happened because car accidents were a problem and people and car makers kind of went along with the program to make cars safer. It was a virtue, even, even as corporations are not going along with a lot of other aspects of these kinds of hyper objects. So, so, so one, one thread that to me is really interesting here is kind of the, the dull roar of systemic institutional scale problems that feel overwhelming that all of us are, are, are all too aware of. And that this is creating this, this background sense of dread and fear <clears throat> and shared whatever um, and helplessness that we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, and I see Nancy wrote Trump in there. I'm thinking what's going on in North Carolina with the voter fraud and, and what's happening in Wisconsin where the, the Republicans legislature is stripping the incoming Democratic governor of powers. I mean, the political scene's got plenty of stuff to really fry my ass. And um, so I, I hopefully at this point, we all have something that, that we can now latch on to. Right. So once again, I'll ask you um, if you would to close your eyes, go inside, connect with your breathing. And we're going to work on a scale of one to 10. So take your chosen object of anger and take it from the background and turn it up to about a three. And notice what happens in your body. Is there tightness, sense of constriction or heat? Do your knees lock? Do you make fists? Do you clench your butt? Does your jaw get tight? 
your shoulders. And if you're willing, double that. Take it from a three to a six and really start to feel. Mm. Yeah. Notice how you breathe when you went from a three to a six. Notice what happens to your musculature. Feel your face, what happens to your face. Remember to keep breathing. And once again, if you're comfortable, push it up to a nine. I want you to really presence this thing in a strong, strong way. Okay, pay attention to what's happening. Do a quick body scan, notice where the tightness is or the constriction or tension, and then take it back down to a six. Take a breath. Notice that you can take it from six to a nine and back down. And now take it back to a three. And now let it go and shake out your arms and legs and do a couple of cleansing breaths. Stretch. <coughs> okay, how about some feedback on that? Gene, go ahead. I just want Ken, why is it that you allow things that you have no influence over to have such a control over you? I, I'm, I'm going to take that conversation offline with you if you like, Gene. I want to talk oh. about that right now because we're in the middle okay. of this process. Okay. I noticed that as I worked up the scale, my breathing got more rapid and more shallow and tension in my shoulders. Um. I noticed that I'm really good at uh, making the exterior stay looking calm, mm. but it goes to my stomach and my lips tingle. But I can keep the mask, baby. I can keep the mask. Thank you. I was feeling just tightness around my heart, just um, a focused breath, kind of like a cartoon of Angry Bull in, in some early uh, Hanna-Barbera comics, you know, sort of like, like a snort feeling, and then <coughs> constriction here, and it's, it's kind of surprising how quickly you can take yourself in and out of, of a place like that. I just have this overwhelming urge to reach out and throttle somebody. Mm -hmm. Nice. But it has to be constrained. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's action unavailable. Trudy, go ahead. Well, it, I also noticed that, that I have an internal suppressor that starts regulating before I get up very far. That's a breathing response and some other things. I have no idea how that came to be, but trying to consciously create it, um, there was internal resistance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I noticed something interesting was when you gave us, um, and Judy reminded me of that because she, she used the word resistance, when, when we were instructed to, to lower, the, to, to tone it down, I kind of felt like I didn't want to, I wanted to, engage with being enraged and being uh, angry and it was kind of just a reluctance to get let go which was weird yeah. that was yeah that was interesting very fascinating mm -hmm. it's interesting to me partly and this is not so much reporting on the exercise as as meta on what we're doing but the, the earlier conversation about feelings emotions moods um i find a really important thing as i get a holder is to just report on what's happening like, like just assess the feelings, don't turn them into emotions, just assess the events, you know, whatever it is, whether I'm in a meeting and somebody said something really stupid or Trump has just done something idiotic <clears throat> that, that looks, looks criminal or, or whatever it might be. Um, but also a lot of things arrive in shiny rap and it's a celebrity saying it, it's somebody who's become a business icon or a cultural icon. And then if, if, you, if you can strip away the veneer 
and the coding and the Christmas wrap or whatever it is, and just take the thing as thing, your opinion about the thing often changes dramatically. And your vocabulary for responding amplifies like crazy because you're not, you're not triggered into either complete acceptance of what this person said because they're such a celebrity, like Richard Branson. I was at a conference once where he spoke and everybody was busy idolizing Richard Branson. I'm like, what he just said was crap. <clears throat> um, just complete and total crap. Mm -hmm. um, and he's riding this insane celebrity wave. Like, how did that happen? Well, I kind of know how that happened. But, but, but the ability to, to drop the veneer or peel back uh, the coding, I think is a skill. And it's a skill that some of us can internalize over time and, and get a little bit better at. It's a skill that a lot of us are completely unaware of and we're busy being manipulated through, you know, shiny wrappers, et cetera, et cetera. So sorry to, to just not be reporting directly, but it took me to that, that part of this conversation. It's, it's great. I love what you're saying. It's, it's, I think um, it's very true, Jerry. Yeah. It, it points to where I want to go with this actually, which is, um, I, 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 I want to do one more. I want to do the same process with something that makes you afraid. I want to work with fear so we can get the contrast between fear and anger in the body because you might find that they're significantly different in some important ways. So um, I'll invite you first though. Wes, did you want to say something or? Dave? Uh, Dave fine, thanks, right? son. thanks, go. Okay. So same process, if you will. First, think of something that really scares you. Uh, for me, it's the fear of being buried alive has always been one of those things that just gives me the willies. You know, there's this uh, there's a cave in in the hills in in the in Gold Country. Where I understand you have to to crawl through a very tight spot and and do basically a 180 degree turn. And I people get in there and they get stuck. And I'm like, oh my god, that just I just the thought of that just gives me the willies. So. Um, I'll, I'll leave you to come up with your own, but think of something that really brings up a physical response like, Ugh. <coughs> and then when you're ready, we'll do the same thing of go inside. First connect with your breathing and feel your feet on the ground so you know that you're grounded and you can handle this. You have resources. And then when you're ready, to mind your fear in the background and turn it up to about a three. Sweep your awareness through your body from head to toe. What's it like when this thing is buzzing at a three? How is it different from when it's not present? And now if it feels okay, go ahead and double that. Bring it to a six. Now it's really present. Where in your body do you feel it most? Does it have a specific location or does it move? Is it hot or cold? Static or dynamic? Pay particular attention to your eyes and your jaw and your legs. Do you want to run? Are you frozen? Are you ready to fight? And now just for a minute, let's take it up to a nine. Really embody this thing. out, take it down to a six. Notice you can go from a nine to a six. And then take it down to a three. Notice what it's like between nine, six, and three. Notice you can take it from nine to a six to a three. And let it go. Check out your arms and legs. Breathe. <clears throat> the shaking of limbs is very important. There's a whole set of exercises called trauma releasing exercise. You can Google that. Um, they've done studies on uh, 
people who've been in bomb, you know, situations with the buildings being bombed and um, the kids tend to shake. They let their fear actually shake in their body. And afterwards they're not traumatized. And the adults who are going around trying to say, it's okay. They don't allow themselves to shake and they end up traumatized. So the trauma releasing exercises actually get you to the point where you are um, shaking your body, where, where it's kind of an animal instinct. And it literally shakes the trauma out of you and lets you process it in a much healthier way. Um, and I'm not at all surprised that Jerry's got those listed in his brain already. So, so it's, it's um, one place that, I, that I'd like to take the conversation uh, in the future on future calls is uh, April is busy reading Bessel van der Kolk. Um, the body holds, uh, sorry, here we go. The body keeps the score. Mm -hmm. And there's several other people who are sort of on this about psychological trauma and how our bodies hold trauma and what that means and how to deal with it. And there's, you know, lots of different ways of, of dealing with this, but um, super, super interesting things uh, that are in line with where you're taking us on this exercise at this point. So we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay. So if everyone's to report on what that was like, what do you notice in terms of difference between anger and fear? I noticed that I was at even level three to four, I was like poised to move. Mm. There was a, a, a sort of a foot nervousness, but it was almost like I moved up on, on the front of my foot and I was getting ready to move. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like your flight response was highly activated there. Yeah. And then as it went higher, then I started shifting into fighting. <laughs> it mm -hmm. was kind of weird. Interesting. Yeah. Michael? Um, the aggression, the fighting was an outward and had a forwarding in it. The, the fear one was more protective and pulling down an end down into the pelvis. You know, it was the, the, the edge of the trembling. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I've been a little distracted, so I haven't, you know, I, I apologize for that. But, but I also realized I, had a, I have a hard time, I think, creating the fear inside myself or the anger. And it's not, I mean, I, I recognize that I have it. I'll be, you know, I'll have these flashes of anger, you know, that come from reading the news or whatever. But when it came to, like, provoking it for myself, I, I, I didn't really know how to do it. And I'm going to ponder that some more. No worries. It's... It's a contrived situation where we're, you know, it's much different. We're all in the same room because then we actually have a whole field right there. And when you're, you know, sitting on the end of a computer and you've got stuff going on, a guy installing fiber and stuff, so it's, it's not to worry at all. He's all excited because he's going to get like a gigabit in a second. It's just like, I, I, I'd be off. I, I'd be unable to host the call. So. <laughs> what what you to be angry about. You know? Right, right. All, all world problems go away. Um, I found it harder to find and, and, and latch to the fear that, rather than the anger. It was much more difficult. But then, but then it was subtle, but where, where fear for me was sort of the breathing heart constriction here, the anger was back of head and, and lower in the body, more towards stomach. And I, I could feel things happening there, but not up here. Mm -hmm. And so, so it felt like a different kind of response. I wasn't having a gotta get out of the room sort of thing, but then I didn't pick a going to be buried alive or, you know, die in a fire or be stabbed yeah. by snakes or anything like that kind of scenario. Um, snakes with knives, huh? That's, that's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we, we didn't have sharks with lasers, so we only have <laughs> sea, bass, sea bass with flashlights is the best we could do. Anyone Anybody else? else? Uh, for me on the fear, it was, um, a dynamic uh, sensation across my chest uh, was was being being amplified and uh, clenching of jaw and um, eyeballs really sort of pulsating. So um, physical sensations. Yeah, I just add that there's in time sense anger was speed up. I want it now. Give me whereas the fear was stop the world, I want to go away. You know, so I don't want time moving versus I do. Thank you. Anyone else? Gene? 
I, I, sorry, I felt something quite similar to what Judy was, was explaining, just the urge to move and like even move my arms. It was, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. I only get angry because I don't understand Michael. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're muted, Michael. But should we have like live subtitles? <laughs> yeah, my comment was that it also makes you laugh, Gene. So what the hell? Um, so I'm aware of the time. I want to do one last thing, and then we can sort of debrief this a little bit. And that's to to end on a. Um, uh, one more tool, which is, this comes out of martial arts practice. Um, Jerry will probably recommend enlarging your center. So um, I, I have had the good fortune to meet with Wendy Palmer, who's a six degree uh, black belt in Aikido. And I have seen her um, attacked by six men at once, big guys, you know, and, um, and she just moves in a way where these guys just go flying. And she will tell you that this is not her. This is she. She's able to do this because she enlarges her center. So she's able to sense the 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 movement towards her long before it actually reaches her and move from a place of expanded um, uh, awareness. And she's got an interesting book called um, is it Aikido as a Clairsentient Practice, I think. Um, um, so the book I know of is Leadership Embodiment. Uh, there's uh, the practice of freedom, Aikido principles yep. as a spiritual guide. How about that? <clears throat> One right of it. it. It was right above it. It was Aikido. Um, oh, the other one. Sorry. Uh, the intuitive body. Intuitive as body. A, Aikido is a clear as a clairsentient practice. Hmm. Yes. Um, so I, this was twenty plus years ago when I was involved in the in, in integral transformative practice community. I got to to be part of this. And so, in order to enlarge your center, I'm going to ask you one more time if you would you can do this seated or standing. Um, one more time. Close your eyes. And this time. As you connect with your breath, allow your attention to come to your belly, right below your navel in what we call the hara or the dantian. It's a little energy center. And then just let your awareness drop through your legs, into your feet, through the floor, down into the earth, like you're growing roots. And just deeply connecting to the earth and feeling the earth support you. And as you breathe out, just see energy spiraling down into the earth. And now as you breathe in, feel energy spiraling up through the earth, up through your feet and your legs and coming into your belly. And feel this little pulse of energy between you and the earth. It's two-way communication, grounding, clarifying, strengthening, presencing. And now on your next inhale, feel energy moving up from the earth up through your belly, up your back and out the top of your head, right? As if there was a string lifting you up and going on out through the roof into the sky. And then when you inhale again, pull that energy down from the sky until you have a pulse going between your belly and the sky. Ooh. two-way full of energy. And now connect the two through your belly so you have energy going all the way down to the earth and coming back up through you and all the way up into the sky and down from the sky through you and back into the earth. This is that vertical dimension of eternity. Stretch out long enough, far enough and you go all the way down to the micro, micro scale of, of the quantum foam and all the way up to the, to the universal scale filled with galaxies. Now bring your attention to the area around your heart and open up your back and send energy out from your back and feel behind you all the people who loved and cared for you when you were little. Maybe they're not here anymore, but they're still here in your heart. And they still love you. And they're still looking out for you and wishing you well. 
feel all that, all the people behind them who loved them, cared for them, and the people behind them, and the people behind them, until you can feel a connection with all the people who've loved each other all the way back to the dawn of humanity. Their love, their care, their choices led to your being here today. And that too is present with you. And breathe that into your heart. And now open up your sides and breathe out through your sides and feel a connection to all the people who are in your life now who love you, who care for you, who are your friends and your family and your support. And know that they're with you and they're wishing you well. And they want to see you thrive and they want to see you flourish. And they're so grateful for your presence in their life. I feel all the people standing besides them, beside them, who are offering them the same. And all the people beside them, beside them, beside them until you're connected to this great web of humanity this evolving, emerging consciousness that has a chance to become aware of itself and incredibly intelligent. And breathe that into your heart. And now open up the front of your body and breathe into the future. Think of all those babies waiting to be born who are waiting for you to pick them up and love them and guide them and care for them and grow them. All those friends you haven't met yet who are gonna be incredible, important people in your life. All the children who'll be born to all the children who'll be born to all the children who'll be born to all the children waiting for their chance to be here, to take on a body and walk on this earth where we get to stand today. And breathe that into your heart. And now you're connected through the six dimensions. All of this energy from earth and heaven, from past to future, from present and community, from individual to the world. You stand at the center of that web. And breathe in gratitude and breathe out love. And when you find yourself stressed and you find yourself harried and annoyed and anxious and afraid, just stand and do this simple meditation. And you find that you have access to way more resources than you thought. And when you're ready, smile like the mindfulness spell, and open your eyes and come back to the room. Talking object in the middle, as they say. <laughs> this is a good feeling to go into the rest of the day with. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. I probably should have saved that for just a few more minutes after I'd spoken. I just want to say the reason I do these exercises around taking a fear or anger from a three to a six to a nine is that if we do this regularly with body scans, we can become aware of the early warning signs of when we might be in at a risk of suddenly being pushed over the edge and becoming unreasonable in our conversations. So I know for me, there's certain things that, that show up of, oh, 
I'm getting a warning that I need to shift my posture or my breathing or ch change the conversation or, you know, speak up and say, hey, this is becoming hard for me and ask for permission to change something, which is a much more, I think, sensible and intelligent way to handle difficulties than waiting until I've blown up. So I hope that these practices and tools have been useful for you, for you today and that, as Jerry said, you've got something to go, in, go forth into the day with that makes you feel good. And I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. I know you're all wonderful, busy people, and it's an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you for your, your being here today. Ken, thank you. Lovely. Thank you Thanks so much so for much, guiding Ken. us. Go ahead, Isabel. Sorry. I was just saying that was so lovely. Thank you so much. I was really yeah. appreciated that. Thank you. Same here. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who are new to the call, if you want to receive updates for when our next calls are, if you go to insidejerrysbrain.com, you'll find a link that says um, hear about future calls. Click there and it'll get you on a, on a Google group mailing list where um, we do a little bit of conversing and where I post what, what our next calls are. <clears throat> um, if you, as, as you have ideas of where this conversation could go, uh, suggest those on the list. Uh, it'd be great to, to go that way. And uh, I will send, <clears throat> yes, um, the, so I'm gonna upload this call to YouTube once it's uploaded, I'll send a note to the Inside Jerry's Brain list that includes a link to the YouTube video and a copy of the chat. So that will come to, uh, to everybody afterward. Um, and uh, Isabel and Les, I'll, I'll remember, I'll, I'll, I'll try really hard to remember to copy you on that uh, because you may or may not be on the Inside Jerry's Brain list by then, et cetera, but, but thank you. Any, any thank you. closing thoughts from anybody? Great session. Yeah, thanks, Ken. That was really, really interesting stuff. I also thought it was delightful, though. Uh, I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty connecting. Do you mean in the electronic sense or in the... No, no, in, 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 in... That thing. Yeah, in the, in the emotional sense, I think. In the great ineffable sense. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Gene. I, I, I just need to say how much I really appreciate both of you. Ken, that was very special and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm in Vancouver actually next week for a meeting. Um, and so there won't be a lot of uh, inside Jerry brains, Jerry's brain calls next week, but then as we run into the holidays, uh, kind of as many as we, as we can have or want to have. So suggest topics, converse, um, and there we go. Thank you for being here. Ken, thank you for your guidance. This is really lovely. It was my pleasure. Thank you all. Bye, Happy everybody. holidays, whatever you're celebrating. Thank you again, Ken. Same here. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.